All right, let's go ahead and open our Bible, 2 Samuel. We're going to finish off uh, chapter 12. Well, not, not exactly, I'm sorry. We, uh, we're going to finish off the story of David and Bathsheba. And uh, we'll finish off chapter 12 next Sunday. But today we are going to focus on verses 15 through 25. What I'll do is I'll, I'll read 15 to 25. Um, I'll start the sermon by recapping what we discussed last week, and then we'll get into our passage today. And uh, I'm actually going to start right in the middle of verse 15, where it says, And the Lord afflicted the child. That's where I'll start. It says, And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him, The child is dead? He may do to himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were worship, were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? They said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And when he went into the house of the Lord, and he went into the house of the Lord and worship, he then went to his own house. And when he asked, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servants said to him, what is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows whether the child will be great? Who, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall not go to him, but he shall but he shall return. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. He called his name. <clears throat> then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. The Lord loved him and sent the message by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. And that is the word of the Lord. Amen. I should have known I would have had a hard time reading this passage. It's too easy. Not enough hard names in it this time. So I took it for granted that it was going to be very easy. The Lord has a way of humbling us every single, every single day. Uh, so last week we, I preached on the consequences of David's sin. And uh, we, we spoke about his relationship with, um, with Bathsheba. And we saw things happen in, in, in parts or in sequences of events. Uh, first, we saw that the Lord confronted David through the prophet Nathan. And uh, he confronted David of his sin. And we saw how that was a depiction of the God that we serve. Uh, we serve a merciful God. And, and that is who he is. He is completely merciful. We are stuttering. We, we are studying the, I'm stuttering, but we are study, studying the attributes of God in Sunday school. And uh, mercy is, is, is one of the, the, the attributes that we talk about. Now, when it comes to the attributes of God, one thing I've noticed every Sunday school teacher say is that this one thing is not what God is only about. Uh, or he is not only merciful. He is not only holy. He is not only gracious. He is all these things all together. The, all these things flow from him. He is a definition of all these things. So when we say we serve a merciful God, we serve a God who is full of mercy. But on the other side, we also serve a holy God who is completely holy in every way, who is without sin. So how can it be that we serve a merciful God, yet one who is holy? Well, when we say that, we, we say that he, in his mercy, has allowed sin, but not without a price. Uh, the price of sin is uh, his, his son, uh, the sacrifice of his son. 
And, and that is why Christmas is so important for us today. But one thing we must recognize is that no sin goes unnoticed by God. As a parent, it is one of the hardest things to do is to hold your children uh, to a perfect standard and to not let one of their bad decisions go by. We are, we, our knowledge is limited. And, and sometimes they're able to do things without us knowing it. God knows, but we, and that's something I remind my kids all the time, I may not know, but God always knows. So God is not like us where we miss things. No sin goes unnoticed with God, nor does it go unpunished by the Lord. Nathan, Nathan was told to go and confront David about his sin. And Nathan did it in a very smart way because he was speaking to a king. He was speaking to a man who could take his life if, if he upset him too much. So Nathan used a parable to confront David and to get to the heart of the matter. In the parable, there was a rich man. And there was a poor man. The rich man represented David. The poor man represented Uriah. Uh, the rich man neglected his riches. He had everything he wanted. He had a visitor come in. Uh, instead of slaughtering a lamb from his flock, he took one. He took the one or the only one that the poor man had. He took. He neglected his riches to take everything from the poor man to prepare for the visitor. Now, this was a representation of David taking Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and, and then also having him killed and then marrying her. That was the confrontation that Nathan was to have with David. Second, the Lord exposed David's sin. Uh, that was a depiction of how we serve a God who knows not only our actions, but also our hearts. We stand exposed to the piercing judgment of God. He is the only one who knows us inside and out. He knows our actions and our thoughts. What we do in darkness, the Lord reveals by the truth of his word and also by the working of his providence. That's why there is discipline. And we'll get to that here in a second, because that's exactly what happened to David. Just when David had become indignant with the actions of the rich man in the parable, uh, David did not know it was a parable. But when he became, he thought it was an actual story and he interrupted Nathan in the middle of this story and he, he, he proclaimed judgment on the rich man that he must die and that he must pay back fourfold of what he took. It was at that moment in time that Nathan revealed to David that he was that rich man. And at that point, David could do nothing but confess his sin in shame. He had no excuses for it. And one thing I thought that was very interesting is that he did not ask for any pity from God. All he did was say that he sinned against the Lord. Then third, after David's sin is exposed, we see that the Lord disciplined David for his sin. And when he disciplined him, we see that his hand was harsh upon David. But in his discipline, the Lord did not crush him, nor did he destroy him. What David had done in secret, the Lord would do to him before all to see. Verse 11, the Bible says that he would raise evil against him from his own house. Also in verse 11, he would take David's wives and give them to his neighbor. Verse 14, he would take the life of the child that was conceived by David and Bathsheba's adultery. See, David was shown mercy, but because of his sin, the baby would have to die. And we talked about how that was a picture of the cross all the way back to 2 Samuel. Finally, we can put ourselves in David's shoes and we can say, yeah, we're like David in this situation. We weren't like David when he killed Goliath. We weren't like David when he won all those victories. But when David sinned egregiously against God, that's where we can put, our, we can put ourselves in his shoes. Because we have sinned against a holy God. And because of our sin, the baby born on Christmas must die. So it's a beautiful picture of the cross all the way back to the Old 
are from the Old Testament. When we look at this story, we see that the discipline of the Lord was both terrifying and comforting. Terrifying in what calamity he brought upon David and seeing what he's capable of in his discipline. A lot of people don't want to see that about God. They don't want to see that. They don't want to acknowledge that. They want to say God is only a God of love. Yes, he is a God of love, but he is also a just God. He is a holy God, and we must remember that his attributes all come together perfectly. So when we see that his discipline is terrifying, for us who are in Christ, it is also comforting. Because we saw that God disciplined David for his own good. He knew just the amount of discipline to give him, but yet it was harsh upon him. Well, today we pick up right after God's discipline upon David was proclaimed by the prophet Nathan. And now we, we're, we're going to see it, or we, we see it come to fruition in our passage. The very first thing that we see is that the child dies. And that's exactly what the Lord said. But one thing that's unique here is that um, the Lord wasted no time in executing his judgment on David. Uh, let, follow me with these sequence of events. Chapter 11, verse 27. The Bible proclaims that the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The thing that is being referenced here is his adultery with uh, Bathsheba. So that displeased the Lord in verse 27. We talked about how that was just a, a, a frightening passage. It just kind of just sits there and hangs alone. It's the very ending of, of, of that part of the story. It just sits there and lets you know that what David had done was egregious against the Lord. And then in uh, chapter 12, verse 14, we see that um, David had been given mercy by God and he would not die. But look at what verse 14 says. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then in verse 15, we see right away that the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. And that's where we ended last week. And if you don't read any further, you're kind of wondering what's going to happen. It doesn't look good at especially after what the Lord had already proclaimed to David. And then verse 18, on the seventh day, on the seventh day of the child's life, the child died. See, while the child was alive and his life was hanging in the balance, we see in our passage that David did something we would all do or we have all done David prayed for further mercy because we talk about it David already received mercy by not receiving death for his sin God had already made a proclamation to David that the child's life would be taken from him because of his sin but David yet prayed to the Lord for further mercy look at verses 16 and 17 David therefore sought God on behalf of the child, meaning David went and prayed for the child. And David fasted and he went in and, and lay all night on the ground and the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. See, David was not doing this to be rebellious or to manip manipulate God. His intention was only to seek mercy from a God who is full of mercy. Yes, David knew God as holy. David knew that justice had to be served. But he also knew that, that God was merciful in, in, in every sense of the word. When his servants saw him, they thought his behavior was peculiar. Because to them, it seemed like David, like he had things backwards. Uh, look at verse 21. His servant said to him, what is this thing you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. So the fact that he 
goes before the Lord and he is praying and he's fasting and weeping and, and he's, he's, he's doing all this, reveals that David is going to him because he believes that God is merciful. And David would reveal to his servants why he behaved in such a manner. Verse 22, he said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. When we look at this passage, I, it, it really moves me because I, I, I understand what David is doing here. See, David is a man who belongs to the Lord. David is a man who has been humbled by God. This is not the first time. This is probably the worst time up until now. But this is not the first time he has been humbled by God. And when you have been humbled by God over and over and over and over again, like initially, I remember when I was younger and I was being humbled by God and I didn't realize that's what was happening. And, and, and you start to do all kind of things to fix the problem. You start to... Put all your effort into making things better. You start with yourself and then you move on to everybody else. And you're trying to put patches and band-aids and you're just going along. But then the more you grow in Christ, the more you realize that's all just busy work. It, it, it really is. It's all busy work if you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Because when trouble comes our way, our initial action should always be to seek the Lord for mercy. That, that needs to be immediate from us. We're not going to fix anything without the Lord's help. And so when I see this, I see that David had no other choice in his mind but to seek God for mercy. He understood that this was discipline. God made it simple. God said, I will discipline you. So to speak. And, and I, this child born to you will die. He knew what was going to happen, but he, that's all he knew was to seek God for mercy. Psalm 86, 15 says this about the Lord. But you, O Lord, are a God, are a, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The lesson we learn here, the fact that David prayed and he fasted and he laid prostrate on the ground, the thing that we learn here is that no matter what we endure, no matter what we face in this life, we must always seek the face of God for mercy because he is completely and utterly merciful. This is true even when we are going through the discipline of God or when we are going through discipline from God. A lot of times when things get difficult, many give up. A lot of times when things go difficult or things get difficult, many say, what's the use? God's going to do what he's going to do. God has already decided it. Still. Still, when you do not see a light at the end of the tunnel. I implore you to trust and obey. We seek God through our difficulty or when we are going through difficulty because that's what we are commanded to do. And there is no better way for us to trust and obey than to be faithful to the Lord in prayer. And this is what makes it very difficult. A lot of times when things are going well, we thank God and we praise God. In other words, we feel like praying to God because it's all good and wonderful. When things are crashing, when things are not going well, when we're suffering through God's discipline, we stop praying. Why? Because we don't feel like it. Right? We don't feel like praying. How can we utter a prayer when things are going so bad? We don't feel connected with the Lord. We feel disjointed from him. We feel like we are far off from him. Well, David didn't pray because he felt like it. He prayed because that's what he knew to do. As for us, we don't pray because we feel like it. We must pray 
We must pray because that's what we've been commanded to do. Or in other words, we don't pray because we feel like God is merciful. Sometimes understanding God's mercy, feeling God's mercy in the time of your trouble is so difficult because you feel his hand heavy upon you and it's just pressing you down and you're wondering where is this mercy you're blind to the mercy God has given you because he's merciful to us every single day but we're so we're so blind to it and we feel so pressed down that we're wondering where his mercy is because we don't feel like it that's where it comes in hand or that's when it comes in hand to know that God is merciful Regardless of how you are feeling, knowing that God is merciful will get you through whatever it is that you are going through. Knowing that God is merciful will cause you to pray. If you don't feel like God is merciful, then you may not pray. But if you know that God is merciful, the very first thing you'll do is get on your knees and you'll pray to God for mercy. And perhaps... Perhaps he may act on your behalf. If he doesn't, he's still good. If he doesn't, the discipline you are suffering through is still for your good. He'll find a way. You'll be better for it. But we must know we serve a merciful God. Uh, the next thing we see is that David, uh, he goes to the Lord in prayer for mercy, but his prayer is not answered according to the way he wants it to be. We can all relate to David here. So David is forced to accept God's judgment. While the child was alive, David sought the Lord for mercy. He prayed, he fasted, he laid on the ground. Um, his disposition was so dire that his servants were concerned for his health. They were concerned about him. But David was just being humble before the Lord. He was just basically, as we would say, giving it all to the Lord. Sometimes we wonder, what does that mean? How, would I, how do I give things to the Lord? Well, David's just like, I can't do anything. I will not do anything until something happens. I'm just going to pray before the Lord until I hear from him. But after the child died, David arose from the ground and the Bible says that he worshiped. Look at verses 19 and 20. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. Here, when we look at this passage, we're like David's servants. The child is alive. Seems like David is mourning. The child dies. David gets up and he goes to worship. When we read this passage, we expect him at this moment in time to be crying, to be wailing, to be moaning with the pain of losing a child. And I'm sure all that happened. Scripture doesn't get that specific for us. But what we do see David do is that he gets up. He goes and he ceremonially prepares himself for worship. And then he goes into the tabernacle to worship the Lord. And then furthermore, Scripture tells us in verse 20 that after David worshiped the Lord, he went into his home and he ate. And here again, his servants ask him, what's going on? And David's explanation for all this, he says, but now that he is dead, now that the child is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Now, when we read that passage, it could seem that now that the child is dead, David just doesn't care anymore. <clears throat> that that's, that's, could be one way to view it. Um, David here didn't get his way, and then now he's having a pity party, and, and he, just, he just doesn't care 
anymore about anything. But let me ask you this. What if David is rightfully seeking the only true comfort he knew? What if he's doing that? He's seeking the only true comfort he can, and he, he's seeking it in the only place that he can get it from. When we read David and he says, I shall go to him, I see that as a statement of comfort. That's not somebody who is having a pity party or someone who, <clears throat> who, who is just mad right now at this moment in time. He says, I shall, I shall go to him even though he cannot come to me. Uh, that's like us saying, I'm going to miss him, but I know I'll see him again. See, the people in the Old Testament did not have a complete understanding of the afterlife. But most believed that there was one. And we, we see David's theology here about the afterlife. And, and he believed that there was one, and that brought comfort to him. And David took comfort in that though the child had died, he would see him again. I can't tell you every reason why David worshiped the Lord here, but I guarantee that is one. That he went in and he worshiped the Lord because he knew he would see that child again. That is one of the most comforting things in a Christian funeral. I've done both Christian and non-Christian funeral. When a Christian dies, there is mourning. Because we're going to miss that person. But when a Christian dies, there's also celebration. There's celebration knowing, knowing that that person is in the presence of their Savior. And knowing that we will see them again. You're, everyone in here is, we're, we're all alike. We're all alike in that we've had trouble in our life. Some more than others, but we've all had trouble. And if, if, if you've lived to be an older age, you've probably experienced more trouble than someone who is younger. That's not always the case. But as I sat here looking at this passage and seeing David's actions here, how he just rose up and he went to go worship God after this child died, I, I, I think about how, how I have learned to do that in my own life. And again, it goes back to being humbled by God. Those who have not been humbled by God uh, as often, they are going through this. They're learning this. And you can see them trying to fix their own problems. And they haven't yet learned to just go to the Lord and, and pray for mercy. But not only pray for mercy, but to praise him for who he is. Because you know he's going to help you get through this. For us, through when we lost our child... When I lost both parents, when I dealt with the reality of death myself, I, I think back to all those situations, and the only thing that brought me comfort was the Lord. The only thing that soothed my soul was meditating on His Word, was praying, was listening to and singing music that praised Him. Nothing ministered to me like that. I, 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 I understood that people were praying for me. I, I, I appreciated people reaching out to me and my family during those times. And that did minister to us. But nothing ministered like worshiping the Lord when your life is falling apart. So I look at this passage and I can understand why David worshiped here. And I hope you can too. It wasn't that David felt like worshiping the Lord at that moment in time. Again, we go back to what we feel like doing. It wasn't that he felt like worshiping the Lord at that time. Rather, it was the only thing he knew to do. His life was falling apart. He reached out to God for mercy. His prayer wasn't answered the way he expected David says, I'm going to worship you regardless. Because I know you are good. That goes to the other, an, another trait of God. 
Sometimes we go through things in life and we don't feel like God is good. But if we, if we commit ourselves to scripture and we understand the truth of his word, we understand his providence, why he does things. We know that regardless of what we feel, we know he is good. See, true worship is seeking the comfort of God through a broken and contrite heart, knowing he is the only source of true comfort. The Bible says in Psalm 136, 1, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Even when we do not feel that that is true, we must hold on to know that it is true. And God will help us through our trouble. David had accepted his tragic fate, but he trusted that the providence of God was good. I, I don't presume that this was cheerful worship for David. This was ask you this. How much more strength would you gain if you trusted his providence and you sought comfort from him in your trouble? Not because you felt like it, but because you knew that's what you needed to do. He is the one that we need to go to, not only for mercy, but for comfort as well. And then the very last part of this passage, we see that the Lord is gracious to David. This scripture tells us that David comforted his wife. Now, David was only able to do this after receiving comfort from God in worship. Uh, there is something that happens to you whenever you worship the Lord. You're supposed to be emptying yourself. But yet God is so good that at the process of emptying yourself, he's filling you back up. And 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 4 says, Blessed be God, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I, this is what happened with David. David's life is falling apart. He loses his child. He goes into the tabernacle. He worships the Lord. And, and after he finishes worshiping the Lord, notice he doesn't eat. He doesn't get back to normal life until after he worships the Lord. Why? Because he is restored. He is comforted by God. And then he is able to move on, so to speak. Not to just leave that behind. Not that it didn't affect him anymore. But he's able to, to gain strength to move on, to eat, and not only to eat, but to minister to his wife. See, the joy of knowing that God is good despite what is happening is when we are able to share that truth with others. We're going through a hard time. Our life is falling apart, but we're able to genuinely share that God is good. That's what I love about preaching. There are so many times when, and it's, it, it makes sense, it makes logical sense, but it doesn't make spiritual sense. There are times when, in the past, when we have gone through a very difficult time, and the church wants me to take some time off from preaching. And I, I do take time off, but there, there is something special about preaching that has helped me through the most tough times in my life. Why? Because I get to tell you how good God is. And at the same time, in preparing that sermon, in preparing those Bible studies, I am forced to face the truth that despite what is happening to me, he is good and he's worthy of our praises. And after receiving comfort from God, David was able to proclaim God's goodness to his wife. I think what's very interesting here is verse 24. Verse 24 is the first time that Bathsheba is said to be David's wife. This whole time, God has pronounced judgment against him. When God pronounces judgment against him, he says part of his sin is that he is with Uriah's wife. But now... For the first time, Scripture says that Bathsheba is David's wife. This, this is God's grace all over David. 
But we also see that God was gracious to David in a very tremendous way. Like when we use the word, my cup runneth over, this is one of those situations where, where if we were David, or, or maybe David himself said, my cup runneth over at this moment in time. Look at verses 24 and 25. It says, then David comforted his wife, Bathsheba, and he went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son. And he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him and sent the message by Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. See, God had already shown David mercy by not taking his life as a blood guilt for his sin. He had bestowed grace upon David by giving him comfort and also by enabling David to comfort his wife after the death of their son. At this point, if God did nothing else, he would be completely gracious. Now, now God gives David grace upon grace. He gave David another son. This was Solomon. This one was going to be a special son. Because if you remember just a few chapters back, the Lord made a covenant with David. And the covenant with David was your throne will be established forever. Your throne will endure forever. Not for your sake, but for my son's sake, said God. And so... Here, we have this promise from God, but then we have David with this egregious sin, and it seems like that would have broken the covenant. But it it didn't. And and when we're reading this passage, we're like, oh no, David's in trouble here. Things are not going to go as as, as God had said for him because he, he didn't do what God said for him to do. He sinned against the Lord. This looks like Saul all over again. But in that covenant... God had told David, I will not remove my spirit from you like I did Saul. This is not anything you've earned, David. This is a promise I am making to you. And we see David sin and we see his son be taken from him. And it seems like the future of his kingdom is in jeopardy. And then God gives him another son. And he names him Jedediah. That translates to beloved. The Lord loved Solomon. And it would be through Solomon that David's throne would be established forever. Solomon would be no better than David. He'd be worse. And we see God's grace exceeding in his life as well. This is amazing because David had sinned against the Lord. He deserved death, but God was gracious. When we look at that, we must understand this, and I'll close with this. His mercy, and I speak about God, his mercy is made new every day. Every day. I tell my kids that all the time. They, they get in trouble, they get disciplined, and, I, and, and, and I, I try to let them know his mercy is made new every day. You are not shunned from God because of this. You are not shunned from us. There is forgiveness because his mercy is made new every day. And, and we are overwhelmed by his grace. We are overwhelmed because we... We, we, we are taken care of through by his providence. But listen to this. The gift of salvation that we have through the cross, that is grace upon grace. John 1 verse 16 says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. So I leave you with this. What we truly celebrate today, 
It, it's, it's not family. Family is wonderful and good. And it's so good to see all, everybody's families here. It's a wonderful time. But that's not the reason why we celebrate. We don't celebrate because of friends. We obviously don't celebrate because of presents. No, those things are good and, and they, they, they can be godly, but those things are secondary to the grace upon grace that God has lavished on us through his son who came to earth as a baby. Let us pray.